Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, lo mejor para un acto de estos es empezar por presentarse. Me llamo Diego García y soy uno de los organizadores del Celsius, que somos el festival eh, de fantasía, terror y ciencia ficción que se desarrolla en Aviles desde hace seis años y tenemos la enorme suerte de que entre nuestros eh, colaboradores se encuentra Espacio Fundación Telefónica, que tan amablemente nos han cedido hoy las instalaciones para organizar toda esta locura. Tenemos que dar las gracias también, por supuesto, a Ediciones Gigamesh, porque sin ellos sería imposible, primero, que se hubieran publicado las novelas, segundo, que se hubiera publicado El Mundo de Hielo y Fuego, y tercero, que contásemos hoy con Helio y Linda. Y una vez hecha la presentación y dichas las relativas buenas noticias, tengo una pequeña mala noticia, y es que, aunque lo hemos intentado con todas nuestras fuerzas, eh, por motivos ajenos a la voluntad de la organización de este acto, no va a ser posible emitir el, el documental que estaba previsto. Eh, Laia eh, Portaceli, que también estaba prevista como presentadora, le ha surgido un compromiso ineludible y no vamos a poder eh, tenerla, pero... Eso tiene una vertiente muy, muy, muy positiva. Y es que al no tener el documental vamos a tener mucho más tiempo para hablar de lo que realmente nos interesa, que es el libro. Eh, tenemos la suerte, como digo, de que nos acompañan dos de las personas que mejor y más conocen el mundo. We are very lucky because here with us uh, today we have two people who know the world of uh, George Martin books. And they are here to talk about uh, this universe created by George R. Martin. And we have a great writer also here with us today, Arancha Serrano. She's also a journalist. She's specialized in culture. So I'm sure she will ask our guests very important questions. And I think it's a very good opportunity also for you to ask all the questions you want. So I want to thank Arancha, Elio and Linda and we give them the floor. Good evening, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Hello? No? We cannot hear. Very well. What? Welcome. Thank you for being here with us this evening. We are all fans of these great works. The Song of Ice and Fire. So I would like, first of all, to... First of all, I would like to read something to you, and I'm sure you would like it very much. Can you hear me? Can you both hear me? Can you make a sign to the booth if you can hear me? Can you hear me? A partir de las grandes obras de los maestros que le En la esperanza de que aprenda de lo bueno y lo perverso. If you can hear the interpreter into English, can you please look and make a sign to the booth? We are at the end of the room. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? No? Well, Arant is basically reading an a script from your book. And uh, she's mentioning a time where at least two or three kingdoms were fighting each other. Mensaje. Desde ese día poniente tendría un solo rey. Todos portaban, eh, perdón, aquellos que se arrodillasen frente al Lord Aegon conservarían las tierras y los títulos. Aquellos que se alzaran contra él serían derrocados, humillados y destruidos. Así pues, Lord Aegon partió hacia Poniente a lomos de su dragón Valerion, el único dragón de los que su familia se trajo de Valiria que aún sobrevivía. Y acompañado de sus hermanas y esposas, Visenia y Raenis, también jinetes de dragón como él, comenzó la conquista de los Siete Reinos. Ninguno de los reyes de los Siete Reinos era tan temido como Harren el Negro, cuya crueldad se volvió legendaria. En la construcción de su gran castillo, Harren Hall, Harren había con conducido a la muerte a miles de personas, había saqueado las tierras de los ríos y había arruinado a señores y vasallos por igual. En respuesta a aquello, 
Elio, Linda, can you hear us? Please, can you hear us? Can you hear the interpreting? Hello. No, es que los tienen ahí encima de la mesa. En su supuestamente inexpugnable fortaleza. Harrenhall era el castillo más grande jamás erigido en Poniente. Tenía cinco torres colosales, fuente de agua fresca que nunca se secaba y bodegas enormes y bien abastecidas. Su sólida muralla de piedra negra era más alta que cualquier escala y tan gruesa que ni un ariete ni una catapulta podían destrozarla. Harren atrancó las puertas y se preparó para resistir el asedio junto a sus partidarios y los hijos que le quedaban. Aegon de Roca de Aragón tenía otras intenciones. Envió a las puertas a un maestre con un estandarte de paz para negociar. Harren salió a recibirlo. Era anciano y canoso, pero la armadura negra... Le ¿Can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Linda, can you hear us? Perfect. She's reading the excerpt from the book like I told you. We will interpret the question. Siendo el señor de las Islas del Hierro. Rendíos ahora y vuestros hijos vivirán para gobernar después de vos. Tengo ocho mil hombres alrededor de vuestra muralla. Me da lo mismo lo que hay alrededor de la muralla, respondió Harren. Es gruesa y robusta. Pero no tan alta para que no puedan pasar los dragones. Los dragones vuelan. Son de piedra, rep replicó Harren, y la piedra no arde. Cuando se ponga el sol será el fin de vuestro linaje, sentenció Aegon. Se dice que Harren escupió ante tal afirmación y regresó al castillo. Envió a todos sus hombres a los parapetos, armados con lanzas, arcos y ballestas, y prometió tierras y riquezas a quien derribara al dragón. Después, Harren el Negro se retiró a su torre, rodeado por la guardia de su casa, para cenar con los hijos que le quedaban. Cuando el último rayo de sol se desvaneció, los hombres de Harren el Negro escudriñaron la creciente oscuridad, aferrados a las lanzas y a las ballestas. No apareció ningún dragón y algunos pensaron que las amenazas habían sido vanas. Pero Aegon Targaryen alzó el vuelo con Valerión y subió muy alto, más allá de las nubes, hasta que no fueron más que una mosca contra la luna. Entonces, el dragón de alas negras como el alquitrán se zambulló en la noche directamente hacia el interior de la fortaleza. Cuando vio aparecer las imponentes torres de Harrenhal, rugió con furia y las bañó en fuego negro entreverado con remolinos de rojo. Harren había alardeado de que la piedra no ardía, pero el castillo no estaba hecho solo de piedra. La madera, la lana, el cáñamo, la paja, el pan, el grano, la carne en salazón, todo prendió. Tampoco los hombres del hierro de Harren estaban hechos de piedra. Envueltos en llama, chillando, corrían por los patios y caían de los adarbes. Incluso la piedra se, rescreba, se rescrebraja y se funde si el fuego es muy caliente. Más tarde, los señores de los ríos, apostados fuera, explicarían que las torres de Harrenhal iluminaron la noche como cinco enormes velas rojas. Y como velas, comenzaron a deformarse y a derretirse mientras arroyos de piedra fundida se deslizaban por los muros. Esa noche, Harren y sus últimos hijos murieron en los fuegos que engulleron la, la gigantesca fortaleza. Cuando las cenizas se hubieran enfriado, entraron en el castillo. Recogieron las espadas de los caídos, destrozadas por el fuego dragón, fundidas o retorcidas en lazos de acero, y las enviaron en carros a Fuerte Aegón. Así prosiguió la conquista de los Siete Reinos, y cayeron otros muchos tierras. Finalmente, al llegar a Antigua, la ciudad más grande de Poniente, centro de la fe, las puertas estaban abiertas a los Targaryen, a los que ofrecieron su rendición días más tarde. En el septo estrellado, su altísima santidad ungió a Aegon con los siete óleos, lo coronó y lo proclamó Aegon de la casa Targaryen, el primero de su nombre, rey de los ándalos, los Roinar y los primeros hombres, señor de los siete reinos y protector del reino. De este modo, los siete reinos de Poniente se unieron en un gran y único reino por voluntad de Aegon, el conquistador y sus hermanas. 
Muchos pensaron que el rey Aegon convertiría a Antigua en el asentamiento real cuando las guerras hubieran terminado, mientras que otros creían que gobernaría desde Roca Dragón, la antigua fortaleza insular de la casa Targaryen. El rey les sorprendió a todos al declarar que fundaría la corte en la nueva ciudad que estaba construyéndose al pie de tres colinas en la desembocadura del río Aguas Negras, el lugar donde él y sus hermanas habían pisado Poniente por primera vez. La nueva ciudad se llamó Desembarco del Rey. Y desde allí Aegon el dragón gobernó el reino. Presidió la corte desde un gran trono elaborado con las hojas derretidas, retorcidas y maltrechas de todos sus enemigos caídos. Un trono peligroso que pronto se conocería en todo el mundo como el trono de hierro de Poniente. Bueno, pues estas palabras, esta historia, aunque salió de la mente de... Well, these words, this story was created by George R. R. Martin, but they were the ones written this story, so a great applause for them. Vale. Eh, bueno, se, se oye bien, ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues Elio y Linda, eh, Elio and Linda of course, were huge fans of these books, and by the end of the 90s, where only two books had been published, they decided to create a forum, created Westeros.org, and um, I'm sure that that was the most complete uh, forum on these books. All the fans were able to make their contributions and at the time they thought that there were only going to be three books but of course in the end they saw that there were going to be more books and by the end of 2004 we had the third book, the fourth book was about to be published and the um, publishing house in the US decided to create an encyclopedia for fans, a reference book so that the whole history behind this universe created by Martin could be consulted so that people, you know, wouldn't get lost because there are so many families in the book, so many names. They told Martin whether he was willing to write the encyclopedia, but he was very busy preparing a feast for crowds. So he suggested that maybe they could get in touch with Linda and Elio because they were both great experts on this issue. And I think they even know more than Martin uh, regarding many of those issues. So they ask them to prepare this huge encyclopedia. At the beginning they were doing it by themselves like masters of the citadel they started gathering all the information available uh, regarding Westeros, Essos, etc. And this was a task that was very similar to the one by Christopher Tolkien and his father because he was able to collect information regarding his father's stories and at the beginning Linda and Elio were not helped by Martin but then when Martin uh, finished writing the book he started to send them more information but he was sending a lot of information they were a bit stressed up because there were lots of things to write about but then in the end they were able to write the book it was published in October 2014 in the US and it got to Spain a few months later in May 2015 Gigames was the publishing house publishing this book we have this great book with us see it's beautiful huh? Colomines was the one preparing this edition of the book, the artist, and uh, I'm sure if you like the books, if you like also um, this universe, it's very interesting to have the book because there you will see the whole history behind the Song of Ice and Fire. You will see the story from the beginning 
At the beginning, there were only the sons of the forests, the giants, and you will see how the first men got to this land, the first wars, the arrival of the Targaryen family. You see all the different um, Targaryen kings and we see the differences between each kingdom. You also have genealogical trees of the different families in the book, in the books. And we have great drawings here. They have more than 20 artists working in the encyclopedia. We have Ted Nastins. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but he has been uh, doing all the drawing uh, regarding Lord of the Rings. You have this great image of Ministeria. And um, he's in charge also of uh, many of the drawings behind behind the landscapes in uh, these books. And we also have Magali Vienov. Uh, she has also been working for Star Wars and The Lord of the Rings. And Massimo Netti, I'm sure you know him. Uh, by the Sanders Branderson saga, the world disc, and um, he's been working also for the Dune saga for the re-edition, and he's also very known because the next film by Luc Besson, uh, the name is Valerian in the City of the Two Thousand Planets. Simonetti, well, Simonetti is in charge of the arts behind the movie the sceneries, the roles, the spacecraft, so if you have a look you will see the quality of his work. So all these illustrators have been working in the publishing of this book. Elio and Linda have become great cooperators. They work with Martin, they also work as consultants in the TV series. Sometimes they ask to, um, you know, they are able to answer to Mr. Martin questions because they are like an encyclopedia themselves. And there's also, they also have an app regarding uh, these Ice and Fire books. And it's a free downloadable app and you can consult all the different characters, the families, and they've also uh, created Blood of Dragons, which is a game, an online game, and it's um, more or less is 140 years before the facts described in uh, the books uh, of A Song of Ice and Fire. So I would like to ask you, how did you feel when the publishing house got in touch with you to ask you to prepare this encyclopedia? Did you think that was feasible or not? Um, actually, um, it was not the publishing house that contacted us. It was, um, I was traveling with my, I, I moved to Sweden in 1998 and I made my first, 1999, sorry, I made my first visit back to the United States in 2004 and my family was taking a trip across the Southwest um, and I went with them and when I realized we're in New Mexico, we're near Santa Fe. So I called Linda on a payphone, and Linda uh, nailed Paris, George's partner, now his wife, and with the phone number of a payphone I was at, and then I waited, and then George called, and George, you know, this is the first time we met, and he invited me to his house, and we had dinner, and it was over at dinner where George mentioned, by the way, um, I have these publishers wanting me to, to, to create a kind of a world book, a guide book. Um, but I'm busy. I'm busy writing. Um, do you think you and Linda would free, want to write the book with me? And that was uh, a huge shock for us, it, uh, for me anyways at the time. I, I thought my answer was uh, yes, we'd be happy to, but I need to check with Linda. So I was, uh, you know, there's an eight hour time difference between Santa Fe and uh, Sweden. I can't remember, I, I must have called Linda as soon as I got to the motel we were staying at and she was barely awake but she woke up really quick when I mentioned George wants us to write this book together. So it was um, a huge shock. Um, it, we had never written anything like this before 
Uh, we just wrote stuff on our website and on our forum, but George had a trust and a belief that we could do it, and fortunately it turned out that we could. Uh, it was uh, incredibly exciting when we when I first heard about it from from Elio, and you know, like he says, it was difficult to believe that uh, he would entrust something like that to us, um, so not being authors ourselves. Uh, but uh, something that um, George has said afterwards is that um, this is not really in the wider publishing world. It might be seen as strange, but it is not unheard of within sort of genre works that fans become sort of unofficial or official experts and end up uh, collaborating on these sort of um, uh, guidebooks and extra materials. I just don't think there's been anything that has gotten quite so big before and obviously, you know, it, it grew from where we thought it would be in. I mean, the series was growing at the time and uh, uh, the book grew and became much larger than it was. The original contract specified something like 50,000 words. Um, although we could go over that a little bit, they said. Um, and we landed on 180, I think. So yes, we went over that a little bit. Uh, um, as everything that has to do with uh, George, it, has a tendency to grow. <laughs> I have read that George was so passionate about this project that in the end it was difficult for you to complete your task because there were some uh, fragments that were not um, consistent, some dates that were, you know, erroneous. So I would like to know how you put an end to that, how you were able to solve that problem. Oh gosh, um, I, to some degree I have to admit we didn't entirely solve it. There are things that got, uh, I mean, George's contributions uh, were um, substantial. Uh, he wrote lots for it uh, because he had such a fertile imagination and he was so, as I say, passionate. But um, what happened is he helped fill out a lot of the history of the Seven Kingdoms and then there was a little break where he did other things for a while and then he came back and like, we're close to a deadline and the last one is the Ironborn section, the Iron Islands. And George wrote a really fascinating Iron Islands, but it didn't really fit very well with what he had written before. And he, had, he realized it pretty quickly. I, you know, I forgot, like the other sections, I kind of, I compared them to one another to make sure they were consistent, but I forgot to do it with the Ironborn. So we did some things to try and fix it as much as we could, but at this point in time, we were very much on a strict deadline and we couldn't do everything. So the worst thing about it is that the Ironborn are the one kingdom that pretty much interacts with almost everybody. The Ironborn fight the North, they fight the West, they fight the Reach. Um, so when they don't line up, it causes a lot of confusion. And uh, we're still, I mean, there have been uh, new printings in the US. And each time there's a new printing, there's, there are things that are fixed after the fact as we try and get them uh, as sorted out as best as possible. Uh, by that time, I should say, I don't think we were coming up towards the deadline. We had probably passed a few deadlines, actually. Um, as, you know, George himself has commented that he, he really likes deadline. He likes the, he's borrowed a quote from some other writer, he likes the whooshing sound they make as they pass him by. Uh, so, um, there were a few of those whooshes uh, as we uh, got near, and by the end they were basically saying, this is such a complicated book. We need, um, with, uh, if it had just been a straight up text, uh, the deadline could have been much more generous, but the problem was layout with all the art that, and the text had to fit together with the art. And it's a, it's a wonderful layout job that the packaging company did, and um, because of the complications of that, it all needed to be in. The art needed to be decided on. Uh, so while George wanted to write more and, and squeeze in more details, it was basically a point of, um, no, we, it can't get any bigger and we have to put it all together now. So uh, uh, things, uh, things run away with George sometimes when he's writing. 
Bueno, y en esta emoción que tenía Martín. So, as he was so passionate, maybe he thought, well, this is too much and you are the only ones who know about this fact, no? <laughs> maybe it was a spoiler. I suppose there, there are things that we are aware of that maybe, um, but he hasn't shared with anyone else. Yes. Um, we haven't, uh, when it comes to the story itself, like his story and the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, we've never asked or gotten any details about where that is going. But there, there was obviously material produced for this book that uh, didn't make it in. And uh, then, of course, he has read some chapters at, uh, and published or uh, read the whole sort of unedited versions of some of the things that we had to edit down for the book. But um, we also had, um, towards the end of the process, where he wasn't sending us these uh, gigantic so-called sidebars that turned out to be novellas, uh, he was, um, we had a conference call with him and his editor. And at that point, uh, he was going through some of the notes that he had for later periods, in particular for the period where he is going to be writing the future Duncan Egg novellas. And there he had some ideas about what was going to happen. And, and he would um, he'd be going over the notes as we were on the call, and he'd say th things like, hmm, yeah, those were some evil bastards. And then he wouldn't say anything more. And then... Um, I don't think I will share that. And then there were some things that he'd tell us and say, uh, but you can't put that in the book. Uh, of course, when he then went back and when we had written it, obviously the material went to him for overview. So when he looked through that section, he actually ended up putting in some of those details that he told us not to put in. So I think he forgot, either forgot or changed his mind. <laughs> Well, maybe you are threatened because you cannot say anything else. Maybe you know more things that you are willing to let us know. Maybe. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, uh, there's one thing I pointed out before. Um, the fans when we discuss because obviously we were involved in the forum a lot and we were involved in discussing theories and ideas and things and uh, at a certain point in time we learned in advance of other people certain facts that happened in the novels um, and we had spent you know I had me had spent my time arguing a theory that was now wrong but I knew now that George had gone another way um, but I continued to argue on the forum that same wrong argument, because if I suddenly change, like everyone knows Elio believes this, if I suddenly change my opinion, people go, ah, George must have told him something, or he must have known now that it's, it's wrong. So um, even there, I, you know, even if I say that I'm certain of something, uh, you cannot trust me on that. No, he's totally untrustworthy. <laughs> Don't trust the thing that he says. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're talking about the origins of Jon Snow, maybe? Uh, no. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> On a personal level, what do you think is going to be, you know, the future of this series? Um, what's going to happen in the end? What do you think? Although it's a bold question, but what do you think? Well, you know, there was that one time when uh, George said that the last book would be 700 pages of snow blowing over everyone's graves. Um, just describing that. I don't think it will be quite that bad, but um, uh, before we got in here, we talked a little bit about uh, some things that we had discussed with George and uh, when we were preparing the book, um, the originally it was supposed to have this list of characters and short bios for each character. That eventually ended up in this app instead. But when we had made the list of all the named characters and we told George that he had over a thousand named characters, uh, he did make some noise about having to kill a lot more of them. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a um, bloody road ahead as the story collapses inwards and more people meet up. Uh, he has a lot of point of views and he wants to, when he has introduced someone as a point of view, he wants to complete that story. Complete that story seems to very often end in a bad way. Uh, it's not like they're retiring to a nice house in the country and that's the end of their story. So there's going to be a lot of... Uh, but at the end, you know, George has said it's going to be bittersweet. And, and I think that's, uh, that's my hope anyway, that it's going to be at least bittersweet, not just bitter. But... Um, uh, in, a, in a way, I kind of dread the remaining two books because it's going to be a lot of heartache. A lot of exciting things, a lot of revelations, uh, a lot of moments that, you know, you've maybe waited for 10, 15 years to finally find something out. Uh, and then there's going to be some very, very sad farewells. <laughs> So, do you have, I don't know, a guess, maybe, Elio, do you think what's going to happen? It's, it's much like, as Linda says, it's going to be, and, and George said this, it'll be bittersweet. Uh, the end will be bittersweet. There will be good, there will be bad, and uh, that's how life is. Come on, tell us something more. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that if we talk about characters, for example, uh, my favorite character has been Daenerys because I, I like the mythical elements of her story. I, I like the prophecy. I like the uh, that whole trapping of it. It's very much fantasy. Um, the turn that we see for her in A Dance with Dragons is very dark towards the end. She talks about how she's you know she's like her dragons she it's all about fire and blood and she's not made for peace so um obviously daenerys will show up in westeros and she will be instrumental in the fight against the white walkers but um i think there is a great risk that she will become very dangerous as well. And I, I don't know that, I wouldn't bet money on her being alive at the end of the series, for example. Um, I don't know who I would bet money on being alive. Perhaps Arya, because uh, George's wife has threatened to do evil things to him if he kills Arya. So I think she has a better chance than others to survive. Um, I think that somebody like Jon Snow is also going to have a... Because um, I do think he's coming back. I, I don't think that he's going to stay dead. But then is he going to stay alive? Um, I don't know about that either. I think he, there's a lot of sad destinies. And I suppose we could share that we had this one speculation on what we thought was going to be the final part of the series, uh, which would fit the the bittersweet element that George talks about. And maybe the final chapter, the, like the epilogue of the whole series, will be Bran, because I think Bran is not getting out of the, uh, the weirwood. I think he's going to stay there. And I think perhaps he's going to see what happens. The last piece we will see will be through Bran's eyes, seeing what happens in Westeros, how those who survived, how they are going on. Um, and there needs to be some connection to obviously him seeing spring happening. So, uh, But for example, knowing that he will stay there for the rest of his life is obviously going to be a very hard ending if that's how it happens, but it would be very George. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, no, um, and then, as I told, I mean, that was my idea of what I've kind of thought about with Bran, and I've often thought, you know, and that he will, that will be the dream of spring uh, at the end. Him alone in the dark, in the weirwood, seeing his family members, those that had survived, um, knowing, and they may think he's gone. They may think he's no longer around. I don't know, but uh, it, it feels, as Linda says, that feels like George. It 
¿Qué opináis de la teoría de los tres dragones? What do you think about this three dragon theory? Do you see any other character riding those dragons? Well, obviously there's Danny, and uh, if I think John feels very likely as a possibility. Um, It's funny because we, we talked about that just a yeah. few days ago. We were rereading some bits and pieces and uh, thought the fact that I've always struggled a little bit with the fact that there seems to be both Danny and John fitting the prophecies of uh, Zora High, and since it seems like Zora High and the prince was promised is one and the same, so why are we having several people this time? Well, what we thought then was perhaps that, well, because what Elio suggested was that when, when Bran emerges from the crypts for, uh, in Winterfell, uh, there's also smoke and tears for the salt. So is Bran also a candidate for being a Zora High reborn? I mean, he comes out of the place of the dead, the crypts, uh, back into the living. Um, that would make three candidates for a Zora High reborn. Uh, and does that also mean that the three heads of the dragon matches up with the three candidates for a Zora High? Um, so in that case, it would be Danny, John, and Bran. Um, and um, for example, we know that Euron has the horn that is supposed to call dragons. Um, maybe Euron, who um, uses this horn and gets control over one of the dragons, and then eventually Bran is the one who has to fight it away from him and take it over with his uh, abilities as a skin changer. Um, I'm sorry, I, I need a moment. Uh, I, you know, Barcelona is very hot and I came from Sweden and I fear I have overcompensated with how much water I drink. So I need to uh, excuse myself for a few minutes. Sorry. It's been, I've been very distracted. I will fill in for you. Yes, you can fill in for me. So uh, I will, can I have someone either kill this or tell me how to turn it off? Five minutes, sorry. Well, Linda, going back to the books, well, this has the point of view of a master, no, the encyclopedia, and I think this is great because it's quite classical. I don't know whether you had this in mind, but it's possible that if there are things that are going to change in the future, it was not you, but the maester talking. Do you think that could be, you know, something to be taken into account for the future? Well, when we uh, first talked to George, I mean, uh, he brought it up to Elio in 2004, and then we signed the contract for the book in uh, 2006 when we went to the Worldcon in Anaheim. And that's when we had our first sit down with George and uh, his agent and talked about our ideas for the book. And we had already thought about the fact that if we wrote the book as Elio and Linda, sort of with no pretense of a author from Westeros, we really should know everything. We should have the answers to all the mysteries. We'd have no excuse for leaving things out. So uh, we suggested that right away, that this should be a, a guidebook written by someone in Westeros. So that uh, if there are changes, uh, we can say to some extent that, well, the maester doesn't know everything, or the maester doesn't believe in all the stories and legends, so he's going to be dismissive of some of them. Or in some cases, um, When, when we come to the sort of uh, recent history and uh, George didn't want to reveal everything about Robert's Rebellion so that we had the idea that, well, what if our uh, maester first wrote a very detailed account of Robert's Rebellion but then, um, since we have that in the preface of the book, the dedication, the dedication was originally to Robert and then you can see that it has been scratched out And then Joffrey was written in, and then Joffrey was scratched out, and Tommen was written in. Because while he was waiting to present his book, uh, several kings ended up dying. So 
he had to take that chapter out and replace it with a much shorter, shorter chapter because now Tommen is sitting on the throne and his, you know, uh, or rather he would have done the edit when Joffrey ends up on the throne and you have Tywin in the background and you probably don't want a chapter talking about how great Robert Baratheon and his pal Ned, now the traitor Ned, were. So that was our reason for sort of politically editing out things that might have gotten our poor Maester Yandel uh, a little bit shorter if uh, Joffrey decided that he didn't like his head where it was. Do you have a contribution to the book? I mean, from you, originally from you, huh, to the book. Uh, my back on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, mostly little things. Um, our Maester Eandel often references other Maesters and their works, and we invented a lot of names and a lot of the titles. Um, oh, um, one of the one you know one of the things I always wondered about was why is it that the Tullys ended up running the Riverlands? Why were they the the leaders of the rebellion against Heron? And uh, when you had like the Brackens and the Blackwoods, are these much more powerful families, older families? Why did they become so important? And uh, so I proposed an idea that basically they had recently been at war with one another. And that this war delayed the building of Heron Hall. And so Heron the Black was very angry with them and punished them very harshly and weakened them, making the Tullys the most powerful of his vassals in the Riverlands. And so when Aegon comes along, it's the Tullys who are the leaders. It's the Tullys who end up becoming the Lord's Paramount. Uh, and George liked that idea. He kept it in. So, um, But for the most part, it's all very small stuff like... And everything, of course, was run by George. Like, George had to actually say, this is fine. Um, so, nothing really major. Mostly about bridging gaps here and there. Like, it, we said we had a little mystery there to solve, and we would propose uh, some sort of solution or sort of bridging the gap between two pieces of information and um, drawing some conclusions about what would fit in there. And then we would, when we sent it back to George, we would ask, okay, does this work for you? And we had, for example, written a account of um, uh, Nymeria's travels from Essos to Dorn, just sort of extrapolating from the bits and pieces that we knew. And then um, when George saw that, he actually asked, hmm, did I write that? Or did you sort of mostly <clears throat> summarize what was there? Because I have a, another idea. And then he wrote something much better and much longer. <coughs> there are some rumors regarding possible spin-offs of the series going back in the past and I'm sure that they, if that were to be the case this book is going to be a great uh, reference material for that possible spin-off for the TV series do you know whether that is going to happen do you think they will consult you if that were to happen um, I can't say that we know we, we don't really know much of anything other than they're all somehow they're not prequels George prefers to call them successors but they're all set the in the past of the history, and whether um, they were necessarily drawn directly from the War of Fire, maybe it's someone who read um, some, you know, the, the passage in the Dance of Dragons about the, the Doom and in the Valyria, and that they're going off of that. Um, well, we've always said, I mean, we've always helped everyone who has a license from George, or has rights from George to produce things. We've helped comic book writers, we've helped, and we've helped the, the you know, the TV show a little bit. We've answered, you know, answered questions when they had them. So if the, you know, the new producers, new showrunners had questions for us to, you know, if George said, hey, go talk to Ellie and Linda, they remember this stuff better than I do, we'd be happy to, to help them. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it would be, uh very interesting to see what uh, could be done about the history of, of Westeros as well, but uh, I don't know. Uh, um, so far it's been, I think, uh, 
a lot of people have been speculating that they would go ahead with all these proposals and I think that's from what we've seen fairly unlikely and if any but uh, they certainly seem very keen to have something so it'll be uh, intriguing to see where they end up Como cuáles? <coughs> which one uh, which of the ideas or which part that we would rather see eh, bueno, las, las improbables. well the less probable ideas and what would you like to see on the screen um i mean george has like you know i think a lot of fans would like to see robert's rebellion but george said that's not one of the ideas that people that they're doing um i think because uh, george says oh you know once you've read the, we've seen you know read the books you'll or you'll know everything you need to know about it and it's not as interesting i i think i slightly disagree with him in the sense that you know, people read historical fiction. He's a great fan of historical fiction. He knows how, you know, the Wars of the Roses, and he knows how Julius Caesar dies. You know, that's not a spoiler. And yet he reads historical fiction based on those things because a writer interpreting those events is still going to provide you a new experience. Um, so I, I think I'd, I'd be interested in Robert's Rebellion, but I don't think it's going to happen because George said it's not really in the plans, at least not yet. So, um, whatever improbables. I think, a I mean, Aegon's Conquest seems such a grand event. I find it... I don't know. I don't know how I'd feel about seeing that one on screen. Uh, you don't think that a TV show necessarily would be large enough for it, perhaps? I don't or? think it would be large enough. I mean, yeah. you're talking about all the different realms and all the yeah. different players all have to be... And they're all separated. It would be difficult, I think, yeah. compared to. It's difficult enough with the story in Song of Ice and Fire, which is, which at least starts all in one place and then expands, yeah. and now it's starting to narrow again. Yeah. Whereas in, in Aegis Conquest, you have you have Dragonstone, but everyone else has their story, and it, they don't really combine. Certainly, I'd love to see something more with dragons, uh, but that's obviously logistically. Uh, complicated. I mean, they're doing a good job with it, but for example, if you're looking at something like the dance, it's uh, a total of 17 dragons, I think, um, across the dance. Um, that's a lot of them. Um, that could get very expensive. Um, you know, the Doom of Valyria would be fascinating, but that's uh, a lot of dragons, uh, a lot of volcanoes, a lot of special effects. Um, I think that, for example, the uh, the conquest of Dorne again would be uh, really cool to see uh, Daeron's conquest of Dorne, but it is a very um, it's a very martial uh, focus. I, I don't know, perhaps that it, it wouldn't uh, cover the same ground and capture the same things. So. Uh, uh, it depends a little bit if they want to go in a very different direction or if they want to have uh, something that is sort of has a similar feel. You could have something in Essos, you know, you could Bravos, adventures in Bravos or... Do you think the new season is going to be a spoiler regarding the books? For instance, the fact that we know that Recon is dead or that Aegon is not shown in the series. Do you think more or less that shows the fate of those characters in the books? I would not. I, I would not go that far myself. I think um, they obviously had to make some tough decisions on how to narrow down the story. And George said, do you remember from the earliest times when other people approached him about uh, adapting it? They said, oh, this is too big for us to adapt. You know, we we'll, we'll it's Jon Snow's story. We'll just focus on him. And if it's successful, we'll make more films about him and maybe include some of the other Zen. Or it's going to be Danny's story. And it's the same thing. Um, but those are extreme cases. But even with the 70 odd episodes that they're going to have, I suppose it's 73 episodes, um, they just don't have the room for everything. It doesn't mean that those things are not important uh, to George's story. Just not important to many often Weiss's adaptation of it. Um, so I, I don't think I, I would be cautious about considering anything 
that you see necessarily a spoiler. I mean, there's a, there's a few things that you, as Georgia said, it, there will be a, a lot of parallels between his story and her story. And they've said they're, they're working towards the same end point as George. But just by the very nature of the fact that, you know, there are characters who are dead in their story, who are alive in George's, and vice versa, it makes it feel like you, it may be the same, but it may not feel the same. It may not be completely congruent. It might not all fit together in the same way. I think that perhaps, you mean, you can say that a character that has been killed off is not going to be the character who sits on the Iron Throne at the end. That's, you can say that. Um, Rickon is not going to be the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms uh, at the end of the book series. I, I think I would be willing to bet money on that. Uh, but at the same time, that is just the very, very end, sort of, who's sitting on the throne and standing right next to them. Um, there's so much happening up to that point, how they get there, and uh, those are going to be very different paths. So there's going to be events that parallel what's going to happen, but in many ways, um, uh, the journey there is going to be very different, and uh, um, I definitely don't think that any you can say that the character is uh, uh, sort of is just a dead end because uh, because they're not appearing. And then the million dollar question. Do you know when the next book is going to be published? Yes, actually. Um, <laughs> when it's finished. <laughs> Have you seen Martin lately? Um, we saw him last two years ago. Yeah, so um, it's been a while. We're going to be seeing him in... Uh, Helsinki at the Worldcon, uh, and um, maybe we'll get some sense then. I mean, he keeps it very close to himself when, uh, you know, as time has, has passed and he has realized that making predictions is something that he's very bad at, uh, he doesn't really talk to it. I imagine that maybe he, he talks to people around him more, but it's not like he mails us and says, here's an update, I've written so and so many chapters. Uh, so in that case, in, in that sense, we're more or less as much in the dark as everyone else. Uh, uh, you know, he was hopeful before the previous season that maybe he could manage before it. it don't know what happened, but it didn't happen. Um, he's had some status updates recently on his live journal suggesting that he's working a lot. Um, so... Um, Maybe there'll be some good news at Helsinki, but, uh, you know, I, I couldn't say. I hope for it, but I couldn't say. <laughs> Who do you think is worse, I mean, in this case, the publishing house or, or the fans, in, 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 when it comes to putting pressure on him? All the fans, I'm afraid, are uh, a million times worse. I think the publisher... You know, George George himself was a editor. He has edited, he edits still, he edits the wild cards. Uh, years ago he was editing uh, collections of, you know, short fiction from other writers. And But it, even so, he says that the editor is the natural enemy of the writer. And uh, so there is a bit of a combative uh, relationship. Not, I mean, Adam Grohl and he get on really well, but they don't necessarily agree on things. And at the same time, I think Anne and uh, Random House uh, and also Jane Johnson in uh, the UK of Harper Voyager, they've all recognized that uh, George's process is his own. And it has been so far, it may be a slow process, but it has been quite good for selling books at the end. So it, it's, it's not so much that they push him, it's that they bear, they're there to support him and help him in whatever way he needs. Um, fans, on the other hand, a lot of fans are... A lot of fans act like this is a drug to them, like it's cocaine and they need their fix. And they, they get very angry and upset and irate. And I, I don't understand it myself. I mean, Lila and I have lived 
in Westeros just about as long as anybody and more closely than just about anybody. Sometimes I think about the possibilities of the next book and I get kind of this vision of excitement. I get excited thinking about it and then that's it. I don't, why, why allow that to turn, to turn into, you know, anger and why let anger lead into hate? and so on um, as and then on to said. the dark side yeah <laughs> really it does kind of lead into the dark side as far as I can see because some people take it way too far um, in their upset and unfortunately a lot of it is, is the internet it's the anonymity it's the fact that people um, gather in these little clumps of communities where they egg one another on to be as rude and as, as crude as possible about these things I, I, you know, and for them, that's, they, they pat themselves on the back and say they're having a great fun at other people's expense, and you know, what's the point? Well, this book is written at the time of Tommen's uh, role. What will happen then? Will we have another encyclopedia with the update of, of what's going to happen afterwards in the books or what? Uh, well, probably, I mean, our contract allows for an update, uh, 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 a second, a proper second edition. Uh, I believe it was written into it. However, what George has said is that uh, he wants to do the volume he calls Fire and Blood, which would be using the uh, Targaryen material that was cut from the book that we had to condense, and also uh, finishing writing up the uh, Targaryen kings that he didn't have time to write long sections for. Because obviously as we got closer to um, Robert, uh, the later kings where we had a lot of information, uh, it was more about us collating that information than him writing anything new uh, and also from the conference call that we had to him, with him where he provided detail about some of the later kings. So um, his uh, long write-ups ended in the regency of Aegon III and uh, so there's a few kings left that he wants to write about. Um, uh, lots more people in the past to kill, lots more events like that, to uh, more bloody history, to more bloody fake history to invent. <laughs> uh, and um, we, we don't yet know whether we would, uh, most likely we'd have a fact-checking role in uh, the Fire and Blood or the Germarillion, as was the unofficial name for it. Um, and if he does that, I don't know if there necessarily is much room to um, do a second edition of The World of Ice and Fire because what, what will be revealed is, I mean, yes, there will be some mysteries that are solved, but those wouldn't necessarily be the sort of things that uh, our maester would write about anyway. Uh, he, he is not really writing a, a sort of what happened most recently in Westeros. Um, maybe there will be some other volume to deal with that, but uh, that's all speculative from my part. I think that uh, as far as George is saying it, it's um, Fire and Blood that comes after the uh, the main series. So this book on the Targaryens is already something that is going on? I mean, it's a reality? Um, George has, I mean, obviously, there's all this material that he wrote, even, for, like, for The Dance of the Dragons, um, material that he wrote, not all of it has been published. Um, the Aegon's, I mean, Aegon's, uh, the first regency was very long, and we had to cut it to just a handful of pages. So, um, to the degree that a lot of those things are going to end up in Fire and Blood, I mean, it, it, some of it exists now, and I think George has, I think, mentioned that he has worked. Uh, he has a contract for it, apparently, so it is something that is social, but it, again, he said there that, I mean, the winds of winter is, is sort of the priority first, so if he writes anything for Fire and Blood, I'm going to assume that it's probably because it has some relationship to what he wants to do in um, the winds of winter. You know, everyone has their speculation about how Danny will get west? Will she, you know, some people urging her, you know, risk the, the demon road of 
Valyria, and maybe George has a feels a need to write something to kind of explain what that's about. Um, but for the most part, I think the Winds of Winter is his uh, primary focus. <laughs> Well, I think now it's the time for the audience. You have a great opportunity now to ask any questions you would like to ask these two authors. Do you have, I think we have a microphone that you can use. Um, hello. Um, I have a question. I know this show is deferred a lot from the books, obviously. Do you still follow the show or do you just go by the books or...? I, uh, for my part, I stopped after the fifth season. Um, not so much because of spoilers. I, I said uh, I, I was very unhappy with how it ended and I felt I, I didn't need to see any more. I just, uh, you know, I, uh, it's a tremendous production, has a lot of great qualities to it, but it's just, the story doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel like George's story being translated to the screen any longer. Um, and the other aspect of it is uh, spoilers in the sense, I mean, I hear spoilers, I, I run a website, I hear, you know, I have to, there's no way of avoiding them. I can't go and move into a cave somewhere and just ignore it until the books are out. Um, but I guess a little bit, there's a little bit of a, a distance. If I just hear it at second hand, then I'm getting a second hand report of someone's adaptation and it doesn't feel as real to me, it doesn't feel as, oh, you know, when I read it in the book, I'll go, oh gosh, it's been ruined for me. I think I won't really care I, because of that. Um, I've actually worked um, on some previous seasons subtitling. So uh, originally I had intended to uh, stop after the fifth season as well for much the same reason as Elio, although I had been um, ranting about the show uh, for longer than that. I think his sort of point of realization that this is very, very different came uh, at the end of the fifth season, whereas uh, mine came somewhere in the second season. But I had stuck with it, obviously, for the website and the, uh, you know. And then uh, I was asked again to a subtitle for the sixth season. So, um, I said, all right, I, I do want the subtitles to be good. I mean, it is all part of sort of George's work. Uh, and they, they wanted someone who, who knew the world because even if you, you know, just know the language isn't enough, you have to be able to get the terminology and everything right. So uh, I agreed to do so. Uh, so um, I'm still watching because of that. And uh, that also gives me the opportunity to keep doing our reviews and such for the website. Uh, where I can let off some of my steam when uh, uh, things aren't going the, the way I would like them to, to go. Uh, again, they are doing some good stuff. Uh, there's no question about that. It, it is hugely popular and it's uh, very well produced. I just, um, for me, it's difficult not to compare with what it could have been. So I think it's more, it, it all comes back to sort of a sense of uh, disappointment, like, you know, not a child, and I'm not a parent in a child because, uh, you know, Westeros isn't our child, it's, it's George's, but maybe like a, uh, a cousin who's turned out uh, a little less than you hoped for them. One more question. Hola. Well, apart from the fact that you have to use a shield when you're reading the books because they kill everyone, do you know what's going to happen with Tyrion? Uh, we don't know. Yeah. We, I, you know, we know we never really asked George these things, and and George doesn't really volunteer us these things. I, but I mean, my speculation is is that it's very likely that. Tyrion is someone who will make it to the end of the story, and that Tyrion will be quite important. George has said he knows who sits the Iron Throne at the end, which in itself is a spoiler because, oh, there will be an Iron Throne at the end, apparently. Um, sometimes George says things and they feel like you gotta wonder, did he mean to give that away? Was it a slip up on his part? And, you know, for, we've collected 
his correspondence with fans for many years, and and there have been times when he would write something, and it it would reveal things, maybe that if if that you'd think George didn't mean to reveal that, but he did. So I I think Tyrion is certainly going to make it to the end, whether he sets the Iron Throne or whether he's a helping hand to whoever is sitting in the Iron Throne. We don't know, but. That's my guess. This is a guess again. This is George's. As I said, we don't really talk to him about it. I have a question regarding the ending of this uh, TV series and the story. Now, we think that magic has a very important role in this story. But now we see that there's a threat with the White Walkers, so maybe in the end it's going to be more like a zombie story and not a medieval story. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, well, George uh, likes to mix his genres, definitely. Uh, he's, you know, he's written horror, he's written science fiction, he's written fantasy. And uh, I, I, I don't think that it's going to be uh, purely one way or, or the other. I think that uh, there's definitely a horror element to the way that the White Walkers are functioning in the story. Uh, I don't think it's going to go into like a full-blown horror story of uh, just, uh, you know, zombie apocalypse, but uh, uh, it's an aspect of the story. Um, you know, it's go there's going to be magic and there's going to be this um, sort of collision of those elements of the fan fantastic and the horrific. Good evening. There are some theories that you have and that you share. For instance, the children of the forest were the ones creating the others, and then that has been confirmed in the TV series. What other theories, not regarding John's uh, parents of yours, do you think could be confirmed with the TV series? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, well, I suppose, uh, as you were talking about earlier, with uh, um, although you can't say that that's just our theory per se, but the you know who the uh, uh, the three heads of the dragon are. I think those will be the same on uh, the TV show uh, as in the books. So uh, if Bran indeed is one of the uh, Three heads of the dragon and an aspect of uh, uh, Azor Ahai. I, I would s suppose that it's very likely to be the case uh, on the show as well. Um, other than that, you know, if uh, if Ashara Dane is Quaithi, I don't think that's going to figure on the TV show. Uh, they seem to have uh, misplaced Quaithi, and I don't think she's returning. So, so that particular theory will probably have to wait for the books to be confirmed. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't... Uh, the, the theory that uh, uh, Quaifi is actually Daenerys from oh, the future. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm very ambivalent about any and all theories related to time travel and yeah. the Sunrise of Fire, even though, uh, as I understand it, I mean, again, I can't avoid spoilers, uh, but past season has given a lot of... Uh, fodder for that theory, so I, 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 but I feel very ambivalent about some of the speculations. I mean, when you come up with theories, you do it because you think this is clever and surely this is what the author is doing. And if your theory ends up wrong, what you hope is, wow, the author is clever and he's even cleverer than I am. But what happens if the author makes a choice that you think is bad and wrong, and you think that was a mistake? Um, and George is a writer, but I think it can make just about anything work. Uh, and I hope that 
if time travel is some important aspect of a story, that he will make it work for me. I think he probably will. I, I, I'm also dubious that it is, uh, even with the the, uh, the the sequences from last season. I I don't think that ele- that section will necessarily play out the same way in the books. I I think that the interpretation that they put forward may not. They may have gone with it one way, and it may it may have different implications in the books. So um, I'm open to the idea, even if anything involving time travel generally gives me a headache. So <laughs> I'm hoping there isn't any of it, because it always starts being very circular, and then I have to start thinking about what came first and all of that. Um, but yes, George could make it work, and that would obviously be the, uh, a science fictional element, and then he would have um, all of that in the story. Good evening. I think it's obvious. Uh, I think you've read the new chapter in the new, in the sixth book. If you have, what do you think about it? The one regarding Aaron. Okay, uh, that's a fascinating chapter. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, th- there are maybe hints of this in The World of Ice and Fire, but George was bringing a darker magic into his story. Uh, you have references to old gods. And uh, the, everybody keeps asking about the oily black stone that you can find throughout the world and what it means. And, and then you read this chapter, and I, I won't get, I mean, it, it I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it, but it, it just suggests that George is looking at a, I mean, one aspect of the story that's always been the case is George always been, said that at the beginning he had a fairly minimal amount of magic, but that the magic, Uh, to kind of get people into reading the story without going, oh, it's just a fantasy, right? I mean, you know, it starts with ice zombies and ends with dragons, but in between, a lot of it is just not particularly magical. But that his intention all along was magic to become more and more dominant in the story. So this one seems to continue that trend, and it's it's very scary, and it has a lot of possibilities for what's going to happen. Um, but it feels like we're... We're just a little too early to be able to make any firm theories about what's going to happen, because George is very good at sort of overturning your expectations. I, you know, years ago, George actually auctioned off three chapters, the first three chapters from The Storm of Swords, before it was published. Uh, and a bunch of us fans, like 42 of us, pulled together our money to win that auction. And we copied the chapters and sent them all out. And those three chapters included uh, Sansa's meeting with uh, the Queen of Thorns and, and Marjorie, and the Queen of Thorns revealing that she's planning to marry Sansa to to Will, um, Willis. Willis Tyrrell. <laughs> to Willis Tyrrell. And it was so funny because suddenly some of the people who had read those three chapters started speculating, hmm, maybe Sansa's going to get married to Willis Tyrrell and people started speculating, okay, when she gets married to him, what's gonna, how's the story going to go? Is she going to fight for Winterfell? Da, da. And then, well, we know that never happened. George, it was a red herring. It was, you know, things. So you can speculate, okay, this is how the story is going to go based on this. And I have a lot of ideas of how it could go, but I also know that George is almost certainly going to do something I haven't really thought about and we're, we're all going to be quite surprised. I would like to ask another question. You've met Martin in person. You've been able to work with him regarding magic, prophecies, everything that appears in the books and on the TV series. Do you think he's quite a philosophical writer? Or do you think that he leaves a lot of doors open to many of the dreams, for instance, regarding Daenerys and Bran, how, I mean, you've met him too, do you think he's a philosophical writer or not? I think he's a thoughtful writer. I think he's someone who 
thinks a lot about what he's doing. Um, but we know he hasn't planned everything out to the last detail. We know that things take on new meaning over time. He has, like, the, the end is fixed. He knows what the end is going to be, but the journey is fluid, has changed. I mean, I pointed out uh, a while ago uh, the Black Fire Rebellion and all that, all that Black Fire stuff is something that was not there when George started. It wasn't even there when he was writing the second book and he paused and he did a, a sort of six um, book outline. He, it's only afterward, around the time that he wrote like the Hedge Knight, no mention of it at all because it didn't exist. He only created it later, and then now there's all these theories about how does someone like Aegon fit into that. That couldn't have been the case when, in the Game of Thrones, Arya overhears Boris and Illyrio. Boris and Illyrio, there was no black fires. There may not even have been an Aegon. Um, there may not have been a pretender. There may have been something else, but he's now complicated it as the story has grown. So, philosophical, I mean, he's very thoughtful, and I think that's why everyone can take something out of it, and why people end up being able to go round and round talking all these aspects. Uh, it's why academics are writing articles about you know, the philosophy and, and uh, its depiction of medieval religions and so on. In fact, uh, there's a, a, the Martin Studies International Network has recently formed. It is an academic association dedicated to studying his work. You know, we're talking professors in Oxford and the United States and elsewhere who are interested in, 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 and they think that his work is complex enough to merit that kind of consideration. Um, and the other thing is there is a clear point of view. He clearly brings himself to some degree to his stories. He, you know, he, he, who does he know better than anyone? He knows himself. And so his views on violence and his views on politics and his views on women uh, are all part of that story. And uh, he's, he's a great storyteller and I think it's worth looking at, at his work, uh, as taking it seriously uh, as something um, worth studying. Hola. Mi pregunta... Hello. I have a question regarding direwolves. I think they've killed them all on the TV series. I don't know why. Maybe it was too expensive. But there are still four remaining in the books. I want to know if you think that they are going to be important regarding the last two books, do you think any of them is going to survive? What do you think about this, about the dire wolves? Oh, I definitely think that they're going to be much more important in the books. Uh, I think it's quite clear that it is a budget issue uh, and a practicality issue. Uh, working with the live animals were difficult, and then working entirely with CG, well, obviously, I think the dragons are eating the CG budget, <laughs> uh, so there, there isn't anything left for the poor wolves. So, yes, it's more convenient for them to not have them. Uh, I certainly think that if anyone of the wolves is going to survive, it's going to be Summer. I, I think the name is uh, such that he, he simply has to survive as a promise of uh, uh, b b future summers to come. Um, I think that the, the others are more at risk. Uh, I don't necessarily know that somebody like Rickon will die, and if he doesn't die, I, I could certainly see his uh, shaggy dog living as well. I think that both uh, Numeria and Ghost are sadly in, in danger. Um, even if Arya survives, I don't necessarily know that Numeria will. But Summer feels like he kind of has to be around. I would like to 
ask you the following. I think Martin is very fond of Targaryens. He has loads of data regarding Targaryen. But if you ask him what's the name of Ned's mother, and he would say Lady Stark, and it takes him a while to find out the correct answer. Have you had problems uh, when you had to write the book uh, because you had to cut out the Targaryen part? And were there, you know, I don't know, problems because you think that some things were missing? Sure. Um, I I tried to get him to give us the name of uh, Doran and Oberyn's mother. I know a lot of people want it. I thought it was just strange that the Princess of Dorn, who has such an important role in the story, as the woman who kind of makes sure that Elia marries Rhaegar, but she does. We don't have her name. We don't know anything about their father. Uh, even though he's mentioned, her consort is mentioned in uh, Storm of Swords in passing. We don't know anything. So we tried it. George didn't, you know, didn't see the point of spending time trying to come up with it at the time. Um, there are other things where we would try to get just a little bit more information because we thought, A, we, of course we want all the information we can get, and we thought that, you know, this is something that fans would want to know, and also it's something that we feel like it'd be weird for us to try and work around. Like, our maester is so detailed on lots of things, why would he suddenly just kind of blank out on this kind of basic detail? Um, but, you know, there was a limit to how much George could create and how much he was interested in creating in some areas. And sometimes it's because those are things that he wants to be in the, the novels. Like, they'll come out in a novel in time. And other times, it was just, he didn't really feel like it, basically. And so we would just worked around it, and that's this. Uh, and I think people notice the gaps, I think, sometimes. Like, particularly the, the, the Princess of Dorne is something that people kind of noticed, but... Um, I mean, to some extent, um, we often come across when we when work with George and also when we were asking questions about some things and, and going over um, some of the material, we would wonder about things that we knew that we or other fans were interested in. And it hadn't really, from his perspective, it hadn't struck him as interesting, which I, I guess probably so far it hadn't come up as important in the story. And then... From the author's perspective, it was very hard for him to see, uh, well, why is that interesting? It's not going to be important. So, so his, his, I guess the way he thinks about the story and about the characters centers very much on uh, whether they will be important or not. And if he hasn't found uh, some role for them or something interesting about them, he, he kind of has a hard time seeing... Why are you fixating on that? Why is why are people so interested in that? So it's, it's an interesting. He, sometimes an author can have a very different perspective on what is interesting about a story than uh, the fans. Like he has mentioned several times, the whole thing about how fans will um, become very interested in characters that he's just mentioned very briefly and and ask him bunches of questions about them and he'll go okay why is everyone so interested in lord taito's blackwood just because i mentioned he has a cloak of raven feathers why does everyone want to know more about him i i don't know more about him basically um so there's a discrepancy there hola os quería preguntar I want to ask you, what do you think about all those theories regarding dragons? Ice dragons under the wall, dragons in the water, or dragons drinking water in the summer? What do you think about that? That last one I'm not familiar with at all, but um, there have been theories about dragons under Winterfell as well. Um, and the World Eyes and Fire kind of touches on on that notion, um, and certainly the end of Clash of Kings kind of makes you, can give you food for thought for that, but I find it hard to imagine that George is going to introduce another dragon into the story uh, just like that at this stage, I, but that's just my view on it, I, I just, I think Maybe at one point of time he had that idea, but there are things in the latest novels that make you think, well, maybe instead of a 
new dragon, it'll be a dragon that we know in a new role. Um, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Y la última pregunta. And the last question. There, please. Oh, bueno, oh. bueno, ella también. <laughs> okay, two more questions. Sí, es que habéis pedido dos, dos a la vez. Ah, vale. Hey, well, thanks very much for coming. And in the fifth book, Martin introduced uh, a new character that was the son of Raegar, or maybe possibly the son of Raegar. And you just mentioned that you don't think that the Danny will survive because she might get a little bit crazy. So I wanted to know if you think that this guy is the true son of Raegar or is just a fake prince? Because... Um, Aegon is, is Aegon. I mean, so, sorry, the son of Raegar. I think... Of, yes. You um, know which one I mean, right? Yes. 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 Um, that character is who he says he is, except... I believe that this comes out of a... My theory on this is that the people who um, raised him, raised him to the belief, because there's a very interesting bit where... Uh, there's bits where you can see that Boris believes that you can create a king. You could raise someone to be a king, and then aren't they a king? So if you raise someone to be Aegon, isn't he Aegon? Um, so that's my view on that one. I don't think my our view is that it's it's not. Uh, but who Rhaegar's he is? Son. No, no. But uh, uh, I mean, we have the prophecies that there's going to be pretenders. Uh, so uh, I I don't think he's the uh, the final one on the. Iron Throne either. Um, is it possible that he has some claim to it? Well, there's the theories that would make out that he essentially is the uh, last of the Blackfire pretenders. It's just that he's decided to, or the, the ones who raised him have decided to skip the whole Blackfire bit and just call him a Targaryen, now that they can try and pass him off as the missing prince. Uh, but a lot of stories have had, you know, throughout history, there's been a lot of uh, pretender, uh, pretenders put forward as, you know, the, the, ch ch the princess who died in the tower and all these things. So there's a lot of historical basis for having somebody presented as, and, and actually believing that they are this person, but not actually being the person. So... Um, La última pregunta. And the last question. Um, hello. Um, I'm going to ask you about uh, George's uh, writing style. Because um, in the last decade I've been seeing, I've been noticing that, um, I don't know, um, attendance of shortening descriptions in favor of action. Because some people think the descriptions are boring some people jerks <laughs> uh, but um, nobody could say that um, Game of Thrones is boring at all so um, uh, do you think that George has changed uh, um, this perception and why are his descriptions so compelling comparing to the others uh, to some extent, I think that, I mean, George has mentioned that his um, days as a screenwriter in Hollywood has affected his uh, writing in that he, uh, he likes to describe things very vividly. Uh, and I think that he, he writes in a, um, in a very cinematic way to some extent. You really, uh, it's like you're in the story and he likes to describe everything, whether it's a battle or a feast, he likes to describe it all in a lot of detail. Uh, and it's, uh, it's true that it's a style that for some uh, might feel sort of too laden with detail and they, there's probably people who read the, the stories, you know, skimming through a bit and, and just sort of absorbing the action and not as 
Those would be some of the people who wouldn't have enjoyed, for example, A Feast for Crows in the first part of A Dance for Dragons, which are slower and more introspective and very much focused on uh, internalizing of characters and describing the aftermath of big events as opposed to having those big events on screen. Uh, but I think that uh, it's... Um, he, he makes it compelling because he really knows how to get you there with all the senses. There's the smells, the, the sounds, all of it is engaged and you really uh, perceive uh, what is there. And, uh, I think there was, there was a second part to the question which I'm now um, blanking on, which I thought you could... Uh, uh, yes, the, the uh, second part, I think uh, that would be more of uh, if George's approach to writing has changed at all. Yeah. Um, if, and I mean, obviously George has said that he's become more of a perfectionist over yeah. time, and I think he spends more time over his prose making sure he conveys exactly what he wants to convey. I think when he wrote the first book, he was, he didn't feel that he could take as much time as he wanted. I, it came out an excellent book, we all love it. But uh, it may not, if he were to rewrite a Game of Thrones now, it would probably not be the same. It would, I think he would, he would focus on various aspects in a different way. I mean, the, the story would be the same, but his approach to it would be different. Um, he is not the same writer that he was 20 years ago, and 20 years ago he was not the same writer that he was 40 years ago. Uh, a writer who is the same all her career is a pretty boring writer. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, that was all for today. Thank you very much to all of you. I hope you found this very interesting and I want to thank you all and especially Elio and Linda for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks.